Hello, everybody. Bonsoir à tout le monde. Good evening and good morning. To good everyone. evening, good morning to everyone. Greetings to you all from the auditorium at the International Center of the Focolare Movement, where, with immense joy after so long, we've come back to broadcast a conference call. We miss this room. Yes, it's really nice to be able to see each other again and share this moment with our whole global family. First of all, we want to welcome Emmaus and Jesus, who are here with us. Welcome. As you will see, due to the pandemic still in progress, and so as to respect the safety rules, we've pre-recorded some parts of the link up at Lo Piano. Why Lo Piano? Obviously because the two of us live in Lo Piano, where the international groups Gen Ross and Gen Verdi are based. And for those who don't know us yet, on my left is Michele Sole of Gen Rosso and Alessandra Pasquale of Gen Verde. A wave to our colleagues. First, we'll introduce ourselves. I'm from the south of Italy. I always loved singing. I would have wanted to be on television. I wanted to go into that world. I even auditioned for a talent show. But then I met people who told me about Chiara and the charism of unity, and I was really won over. I started loving, and that was how I found happiness and my fulfillment. I've been in the Focolare a few years now, and I sing in Genrosso. I was born in Rome. After graduating in sociology, I fulfilled my dream to become an actress. For three years, I studied drama, and right within the walls of that drama school, I understood that I wanted to leave everything for God. And accomplishing this without knowing it was a director who told us, if you want to go on stage, you must have something really important to communicate. And so the most important thing in my life was the meeting with God who is love that completely changed my life. So for honesty and my passion for life, I, for life, I found myself saying yes to God right there in drama school. We want to start this link up by greeting some of the communities that are connected with us live. Yes, because so many communities have contributed to preparing the link up, like the ones in Lebanon and Nigeria, each bringing their own cultural richness and challenges. So thanks to all of you. Amazing. What a fantastic family we have. Hello, everybody. So let's start from Guatemala City with Lily. There are many of you there. Hola a todos. Hola. Hello, everybody. We know that you're part of Together We Support, the group that's working hard to help many people affected by COVID and who find themselves in situations of need. Yes, this Together We Support group is our motto. So Together We Support is our motto. We try to listen, understand, and respond to concrete needs. We hold online courses in baking, drawing, guitar, how to make empanadas, and we organize bingo. With the proceeds, we were able to help several families by bringing them food and money to pay the bills. We were also able to buy medical supplies for a health center. The needs are still many, and we, together, in fact, continue to do all we can. Thanks to everyone. And now we're going to go to Bolivia. There's Carlos and Lydia in Cochabamba, together with Maria Chiara and Fernando. So we're very happy to be here in the link up and a big hug from all of us in our community. So now we're going over to North America, to Canada. There's Father Yvonne in Canada, in Quebec. 
Nun, Yvonne? Le Mikrofon. Le Mikrofon, Padre Yvonne. Okay, and Yamava. So, it seems the microphone isn't working very well. So now we're going to Africa to Angola, the Lukoki family. Estamos aquí, Elena. Y Alberto Lukoki. Somos un casal de voluntarios. We are a couple, Alberto and Elena. We are volunteers. And we're very happy to be part of the link up. And we greet all of Chiara's children throughout the world. Thank you. Now we're still in Africa and we're going to go to South Africa to Grahamstown, a thousand kilometers south of Johannesburg. Joanna is studying there, and because of the COVID, she's stuck there and can't get home to her family. Joanna. Joanna? The microphone. Microphone. <laughs> yes. Se ne accorta. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm actually alone here, but I do not feel alone. I am with all of you. Greetings from the whole of Pocolari family in South Africa. And now we're going to see what's happening in the Focolari in Cairo, in Egypt. What are you up to there? <laughs> you could even open your mic, uh, turn on the microphone, that would help. Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Now we come to Europe. We're going to Portugal, to the little town called Arco Iris. My name is Mario, and although we're quite spread out in this room, we represent everybody in the movement here, uh, young people, young people in Gen, the adults, priests and families. Greetings to everybody. So now let's continue with Europe and with Scotland. Can you hear us, Tom? Uh, the mic. Open, Open the mic. your microphone, please. Turn your mic on. Quasi, ci siamo quasi. Try again, please. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> Hi. Hello Hi. From Scotland. Hey. Greetings from the Folklary family from Scotland. This is I'm Tom and this is my family and granddaughters. <laughs> Helena. We I'm Felicity. Hey. <laughs> Scotland, we're a small country with a big heart. We send you our love and our unity to all the world. <laughs> Bye. 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 A big hello to you, Tom, and we all wish you of your latest grandchild in November. Yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Best wishes. Best wishes. So we're going to finish now our tour around the world, Mitko in Bulgaria. It's nice to see you again, and we know that you had a very special Mariapolis there this year. So turn your microphone on. La Godaria. Il microfono ancora. Yeah, the mic, the mic still needs turning on. Questo è il bello della diretta. This is the wonderful thing about a live broadcast. Yes. Allora, un saluto da So greetings from all of us here in Sofia. As you know, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to hold big events, so our Mariapolis was different from usual. We held it in the mountains near a river, and we were all in tents. There were 20 of us. It was nice to rediscover the presence of God in nature and among us. 
we had the experience of being a big family. Blagoderia, Mitko. Thank you, Mitko. Grazie, Mitko. Padre Yvonne, riusciamo a sentirti? Can we hear you now, Father Yvonne, with your microphone? The microphone is still off. The microphone. Come possiamo fare? Andiamo avanti. Ok. Padre Yvonne. Un saluto, Padre Yvonne. Greetings from all of us, Father Yvonne. We'll have to move on. Thank you. <laughs> so, on the 8th of May 2004 in Stuttgart in Germany, Chiara spoke to about 9,000 people who come from many different European countries. It was the first event organized by the network of Christian movements called Together for Europe. It was a historic occasion in which Chiara offered the key to building peace in Europe among such varied nations, emphasizing that Universal Fraternity is a program for the whole world. And only a few hours ago, Pope Francis was in Assisi signing his new encyclical, which is called All Brothers, on fraternity and social friendship. From tomorrow, we'll be able to read the text. It struck me very much that today the Pope is saying that fraternity is the only way to overcome the many crises that continue to affect the world. Let's now listen to an extract from what Chiara said in Stuttgart. Universal fraternity is and has been one of humankind's deepest aspirations and has been present in many great souls. Martin Luther King Jr. proclaimed, I have a dream that one day people will come to see that they are made to live together as brothers and sisters and that brotherhood will be the first order of business on every legislative agenda. And Mahatma Gandhi said of himself, my mission is not merely the brotherhood of Indian humanity. But, through achieving India's freedom, I hope to achieve and progress the mission of the brotherhood of all men. Universal fraternity has also been the aim of people whose motives were not inspired by religion. The motto of the French Revolution was liberty, equality, fraternity. But although many countries have formed democratic governments and have been able to establish, at least in part, freedom and equality, they have not yet achieved fraternity, which is more talked about than lived. The person who proclaimed universal fraternity and showed us how to bring it about was Jesus. By revealing God as our Father, he broke down the walls separating people who are the same from those who are different, the walls separating friends from enemies. He freed every person from a thousand types of exploitation and slavery and from every unjust relationship, bringing about an authentic revolution, one that is existential, cultural and political. Many currents of spirituality down through the centuries have sought to carry out this revolution. A truly brotherly and sisterly life became, for example, the bold and tenacious dream of St. Francis of Assisi and his first companions. His life was an admirable witness to fraternity that embraces all things, not only men and women, but the entire cosmos, including Brother Sun, Sister Moon and the stars. The tool Jesus gave us to bring about a sense of family in the world is love, a great love, a new type of love that's different from what we usually understand by that word. In fact, Jesus transplanted on earth the way love is lived in heaven. This love requires us to love everyone and not just our family and friends. It asks us to love people we like and those we don't to love our fellow citizens and foreigners, Europeans and immigrants, 
people from our own church and those of other churches, people of our own faith and those of other religions. This kind of love asks us to love even our enemies and to forgive them if they've done us wrong. What I am talking about is, therefore, a type of love that doesn't differentiate among people. It considers those who are physically close to us, but also those we speak about or hear about, those whom we serve each day with our work, the ones we read about in the papers or see on television. Because this is how God our Father loves. He sends sun and rain on all his children, the good and the bad, the just and the unjust. A second characteristic of this love is to be the first to love. The love that Jesus brought on earth is, in fact, a disinterested love. It doesn't expect other people to love us, but always takes the initiative. Just as Jesus himself did when he gave his life for us while we were still sinners and therefore not loving. The love that Jesus brought on earth is not platonic, sentimental love or just words. It's a concrete love that calls for action. This is possible if we make ourselves all things to all people, to be sick with the sick, happy with those who are happy, and be worried, insecure, hungry or poor with others. By feeling what they feel, we then do something for them. When this love is lived by more than one person, it becomes reciprocal. This is what Jesus emphasized the most. He said, love one another as I have loved you. This is the commandment he called his own and new. It's not only individuals who are called to live reciprocal love, but also entire groups, movements, cities, regions and states. Our modern times demand that the disciples of Jesus acquire a Christian social conscience. It's more than ever necessary to love other countries as our own. This love that reaches perfection when it is mutual reveals the true power of Christianity because it brings about the very presence of Jesus among us here on earth. Didn't Jesus say, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them? Isn't this promise a guarantee that fraternity can become a reality? If he, our brother par excellence, is with us, how can we not feel that we are brothers and sisters to one another? May the Holy Spirit help us all to form in the world, wherever we are, zones of universal fraternity that grow and grow by living the love that Jesus brought down from heaven. Concrete love means being practical, and this is possible if we make ourselves all things to all people, as Chiara said just now. We wanted to start this link up with Chiara because her words are truly the guiding star of the stories and news we'll be seeing now. In these stories, the people involved have dared to care for others. Come dice il motto del Pathway, che giovani del Movimento dei Focolari... Dare to care is the motto of the Pathway that the young people of the Focolari have launched for us all this year and which will gather up all that everyone does to help, support and rebuild. Cosa posso fare per raggiungere l'altro? What can I do to reach out to others? What are the needs in my city or my school during the pandemic? These are just a few of the questions that the people in our first three stories ask themselves in Texas, Brazil and Germany. Then we will move to Nigeria, where we enter the life of a community of the Focolare and see what they are doing to respond to the problems and pain of those around them. Let's watch. When the pandemic struck, uh, I wanted to do something to help people. Uh, many people were feeling disconnected and helpless, and so was I, to tell you the truth. Uh, people were stuck at home and feeling lonely. I got the inspiration to combine exercise and visits to the people of my parish here in Texas. So I put a message out on social media that I'd be riding my bicycle and wanted to visit them. One of the deacons showed me how to use an application available on the internet 
to upload the addresses and to make unique maps for each day's route. I really like seeing the look on the faces of people when I show up to their door and they see the priest there wearing shorts and riding a bike. As a parish priest, I never really thought of myself as a missionary. In fact, instead of going out to the people, I was accustomed to people coming to me at the parish. But once I started visiting people on the bike, I realized how simple but powerful it is to be a missionary in your own town. Pope Francis has been inviting us to be missionary disciples. And I think the pandemic has really given us an opportunity to put that into practice. Suddenly, we moved from a model of the parish being where people come to us to one in which the parish goes to the people. Each day I find myself meeting Jesus himself and my neighbor. We talk, we pray, we laugh a bit, maybe we take a selfie. I see how these simple things strengthen the bonds of our communion the mystical body of Christ, just being present to each other from a safe social distance. We are Marcia and Luis, and we have five children. During this time, we're at home with our youngest daughter, Gabriela. The pandemic has hit Brazil hard, further highlighting already existing inequalities. We have a small business that produces cakes and homemade bread. Knowing that many people were in trouble, Luis had the idea of making bread to give to these families. As we couldn't afford to bake a huge amount, we shared this idea with a WhatsApp group. The response has been amazing. We contacted public bodies and organizations that knew families in difficulty. In one parish, they told us that when they visited families to tell them how to avoid infection, they discovered that many of them had no soap and no masks at all to protect themselves. As well as working with me in the bakery, Gabriela offered to make some soap out of used cooking oil. My wife Marcia started sewing masks, so we can give these families soap and masks, as well as bread. The Solidarity Bakery keeps going. There are obstacles and problems, but God always intervenes at the right time with unexpected solutions. So far, we've produced 2,200 loaves, 1,900 bars of soap, and 900 masks. We're working with 11 organizations that reach over 250 families, plus the homeless and the children at the orphanage. We experience that even when we ourselves have big problems, we can still do something for others. Just make the first move. And as someone said, we become that wind that creates the waves of supportive love. My name is Ulrike. My name is Ulrike, and I teach maths and physics at a high school in Solingen, Germany. Shortly before the Easter holidays, schools were closed overnight. No one was prepared for this situation, and it was immediately clear that a lot of creativity was now needed. I was the teacher who knew about the Zoom platform. So, after a while, I was able to run my classes online, and I helped several colleagues to do the same. At first, we sent study materials by email, but we soon realized that it was too little, especially for those with learning difficulties. So, I prepared video recordings at home, explaining the homework and mathematical formulas. I also went to school to film physics experiments to share online. For the families, school closures were really hard, especially for those with several children. To relieve the parents of this difficulty, we met online with groups of three or four students at least twice a week to keep up the contact with them and talk about homework. Since there's usually not enough time to talk at school, spending more time with my students was a new experience. Despite all the negative aspects of the pandemic, I personally have seen positive aspects as well. For me, it's a constant challenge to set aside my routines and things I feel sure about and be ready to help others with creative love. I discovered that all of this is a source of joy. In 
Nigeria and all over the world. There are people open to the power of God's love in society. They act for the common good. They are active citizens. They dare to care. Black is bold. Black is beautiful. It's not just a color. It's an attitude. When you use it correctly, with love, it brings out all the other colors and enables them to shine and radiate. Offers of work in international IT could not stop this young Nigerian from choosing to work to improve his own country. Now Nigeria is 200 million and even maybe more. And so we have to think about food sufficiency, about agriculture. And we are starting from the root, the subsistence farmer or the rural farmers. These are the farmers that should be empowered. We won't be able to help all the farmers, but we are trying to, one village at a time, help the farmers grow profitably. I've been headhunted before for some other job, but my heart is here. From the starting, we had a vision to try to get people out of poverty in any way that we can help. This place can be a reference point in the future from the time that now is being called a jungle to a time that it will become a model that people can come to see and also teach other people how to practice agriculture in a meaningful and sustainable way. Going southeast to the great market city of Onicha, like every city, there are those who struggle. Here's someone who knows how to get things moving. I, I have a dream of a world that is trending towards perfection, where the whole world will have the equitable distribution of all the resources endowed by the Almighty God, so that everybody gets what he needs. Mama Regina, she has passion of the poor among us, especially the beggars. So she now tried to feed them. So we started with about 50. Okay. We now feed about 300 wow. around Onicha. Mama provides for the money. I help in preparing the food free of charge. And we have other groups that help in distribution of the food. If we will allow only the government to do these things, I don't think they will reach to these poor people on the streets. So we have to go down out there, meet them, and help in any little way we can, any. And see how hungry people are, particularly in this time of the pandemic. You will see the necessity of the continuation. I believe when God inspires something, he opposes it. Because this thing mysteriously is still going on. Those children I want to get out of the streets into the schools. Then those people who are begging, some of them who can, I want to get them to learn tricks and get out of the street and go and do something for themselves instead of begging. The biggest lesson in life is never underrate anybody. Mm. That child that is carried by a beggar, that is begging for food, may eventually become the president of this country. Still in Onicha, young people are driving ahead for a better and more sustainable future. Kasaraba Bati and Sewing Training Center. I'm currently working at Casa Alba. I've been working here close to two years, and it has really been a very wonderful experience for me, both spiritually and then skillfully. Being here has really given me great strength and courage to be more than I think that I can be. We have been learning how to sew. There are many aspects here, like dyeing section, tying section, um, waxing, and then sewing. I can even sew perfectly well design gown that when you see you will love it. Now I'm starting my career in fashion, launching new designs. So then I thought of coming to the Casa Alba 
where I learned my first sewing to teach. You know, in fashion, every day we keep learning. Celebrating 25 years of empowerment. This professional actress is now designing villas in the federal capital Abuja. But she could never forget the widows in her home village near Jos. Growing up in Jos, Jos was a very peaceful place. We didn't know who was who. It didn't really matter to us. But then with the crisis, there is a segregation. We, we don't trust ourselves anymore. Then it puts a lot of people in need. People became very desperate. People were suffering. And the crisis also led to a lot of killings where men mostly were killed. So the wives had to now become the breadwinners. So I thought in my own little way I should help. Yeah. You know, you would have just been another town lady coming to visit and going back, but you took a step further. Went back to my community in Jos, where the uh, grain is grown, and with the help of my late mom. I started a little project of um, processing acha to create jobs, to solve a problem, the problems of poverty. I thought that, well, most of these women who have lost their husbands and are predominantly subsistent farmers, why don't we engage them in processing this crop which they grow and people need? Life isn't um, constant, it's always full of changes. Like I'd say, I had my parents, suddenly I don't have a parent anymore. And then some of those people are the ones that came to comfort me in my time of need. Do you know at times, uh, especially in a developing nation like Nigeria, where you wonder, are we ever going to get there? Are we ever going to achieve that? Okay, we are developed. We have leaders that care about the people. How can we be citizens and still be citizens with love in our hearts? At, as Nigerians, a very diverse country, mm -hmm. we have every reason not to be united. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, in our diversity is our unity. So we need to accept everybody for who he is, where he comes from. And the things we don't want people to do unto us, we shouldn't do unto them. The golden rule. Yes, the golden rule. We should remember that we are accountable. All of us are on earth for a purpose. So whatever, maybe we should actually seek God's face. So what are we supposed to do? Mm -hmm. We may have our ideas, but it may not be what God wants for us. So are you saying what God wants for us as a nation? As, an in, as individuals, because individuals make up the nation. True. So if each person does a, the right thing, collectively we're doing good. Mm -hmm. But if each person does bad, collectively we're doing wrong. wrong yeah. So we have to start from ourselves. <laughs> Say from the inside. Hey, up the volume of dare to care in Nigeria. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you so much for sending these reports. You've really shared something of your lives with us. Thanks especially to Anne, Delphine, and all those who helped make the report from Nigeria. To Luis, Gabriela, Marcia from Brazil, Ulrike from Germany, Father Clint from Texas. And now we're going somewhere nearer here to Ascoli Piceno in central Italy to get to know the Welcome and Solidarity Center, a network of associations that are working together to respond to their city's problems. I'm in Ascoli Piceno, a beautiful city set like a jewel in the market region of central Italy. The city has many magnificent monuments, towers, bell towers, palaces, and squares entirely covered with travertine marble. Yet behind these walls, there are significant social problems. And this is well known to the volunteers of the PAS Association, who work every day to help those in need. The PAS Association, the Welcome and Solidarity Center, was founded after a lot of networking. In 2015, we invited Vera Araujo to come here and talk at a seminar, a conference entitled Love Overcomes Poverty. She said, I think here, she told us, it should be possible to create a good network to help people in social distress. And those were prophetic words. 
Our life started precisely from learning to know each other, to respect each other and appreciate the experiences and skills of each one, of people who had probably worked in this field better and for longer than we had, so as to try and combat poverty. Today, 17 associations are involved. From the beginning, we said we want to get together to do more than we can do on our own. We want to generate this added value through the relationship among us. What has been our fundamental contribution? It's that of knowing how to bring people together, which is the experience we've acquired from the charism of unity. From the first group of a few associations, today there are 17 groups and associations working in this place that was given to us by the diocese with a significant contribution by the Bank of Ascoli, both of which realized the importance of what we wanted to do. One morning a homeless man showed up, one of those who really don't want to know about being helped. He was in tears because he had a very bad toothache, so we immediately welcomed him. During the day he was treated and gradually felt better. The next day he came back to thank us. He was happy and now he comes regularly to be helped in different ways. That shows how love is personal for each one. It has to be tailored and geared to the person in front of you and their real needs. Lunch today is first course, pasta with tomato sauce, with a side dish of courgettes and potatoes, while the second course is fried turnovers. Yesterday we prepared 65 meals, and so we're doing the same number today, presuming that they will all come. Of course there will be a few more or a few less, but we will always have a plan available to make more if need be. When I discovered this association, I said to myself, well, I want to do something here, together with my young children, of course. So it was nice because I joined this association in February and in March there was, there was this Covid thing and then the lockdown. We stayed on here, of course, acting responsibly with all the various precautions, but it went well. Sometimes we made more than 80 meals a day, so this service couldn't be closed. It had to continue. The start of the Welcome and Solidarity Centre, in my opinion, was something fantastic because there were all these various associations, but each one of them was working on its own. Instead, together, it becomes a fantastic service because we join forces, we join forces, and we know that it's one thing to work alone and another thing to work together. You can do much, much more. We see it as the path to a united world in a small land area, obviously. It's just the beginnings of fraternity in a particular place. And the idea is that we don't build a united world on our own, but we only, we help in some way. We are only the stewards of this united world. We build it up in some way. And here we are, back live. We thank Pino Felicetti and all the collaborators in Ascoli for the extraordinary work they do. And for those wishing to know more, they can go to the website of the Hospitality and Solidarity Center, www.pas-ap.it. So, we're halfway through our journey around the world an entire world affected by the pandemic. And even with this link-up, we realize how much it's changed everyone's life and also that of people engaged in theater and show business. We've had to postpone national and international tours and we've wondered how to go on. And we've invented all kinds of ways to stay close to our audience. Sí, Alessandra. Sure thing, the lockdown was a very difficult period for us too, with much uncertainty, but we didn't stop either. 
We try to be close, to be alongside everyone with our songs via streaming and live broadcasts. And I remember in particular one of our friends from a city in northern Italy wrote to us as soon as he came out of hospital because he'd had COVID and he'd nearly died. He said, he wrote that when he was on the ventilator, he watched our live streaming and it gave him the strength to fight on. So living for other people and building fraternity is one of the objectives of Gen Rosso, which today is made up of 22 people from 11 different countries. So now I'd like to show you some footage of our latest song that's called Shock of the World. It speaks of the need to take care of creation with concrete actions to save nature and therefore the whole of humanity. In three days time from now, Thanks, Michele, and thanks to Gen Rosso for this song that really encourages us to get involved personally to save the planet. For us too at Gen Verde, the lockdown was a special time. In March, we were on tour in Spain, and then we suddenly had to leave the country in a hurry. We found Italy all in quarantine, and you can imagine the anxiety we felt when we were waiting for news of our families. There are 19 of us, and we're from 14 different countries. In the very hardest moments, we met a lot of people through phone calls, through Zooms and streaming. We wrote new lyrics and songs, and we wanted to reach, we wanted to reach out to as many people as possible. So now, we're going to let you listen to a part of a song called Vincent's Song, You Did It To Me. We were supposed to sing it for the first time live in New York at the concert at the start of a tour in the USA, but it was all postponed, only postponed. This song was written due to our collaboration in recent years with the Vincentian family. It highlights the harmony between Chiara's charism and that of St. Vincent de Paul. It's an invitation to see Jesus in others, to take care of everyone without differentiating between people. Grazie. 
Thanks, Alessandra. Thanks, Jan Verdi, for this song that reminds us never to forget the poor and those who need us most. Never as now do we feel that our artistic vocation has brought with it social responsibility. So we thank you all for listening and for your support. As you can see from these graphics, if you want to continue following us and not miss our news, here are all the social networks we're in, and of course you can find us on the music platforms. So stay tuned. Sometimes it seems that all the bad things make a lot of noise and that they're stronger than what is good. Instead, there is goodness, as we'll see in the next stories. It's all about having the courage to start. And the next report speak about courage. Now we'll see another three, another three short stories from Brazil, Australia and Vietnam. It was with great joy that on the 11th of August we celebrated Danilo Zanzuki's 100th birthday. He and his wife Anna Maria were responsible for the New Families Movement for over 40 years. We went to visit them at their home in Grotta Ferrata. But first of all, let's hear these other stories. Eu sou fisioterapeuta e Uma fisioterapista e lavoro nel campo della tecnologia assistiva. La tecnologia assistiva è un'area di conoscenza che supporta persone con disabilità nello svolgimento delle attività quotidiane, come l'alimentazione, l'igiene, i movimenti e anche la comunicazione. A causa del coronavirus continuano ad arrivare negli ospedali persone con importanti problemi respiratori e di conseguenza con problemi di comunicazione. In questa situazione locale e globale, con un gruppo di amici abbiamo pensato di condividere le nostre conoscenze, proprio per poter aiutare quando il parlare diventa un atto impossibile. In pratica, creiamo delle tavole di comunicazione alternativa, che sono semplici risorse, come questa, con dei simboli grafici che il paziente può scegliere di esprimere il messaggio che inviare. I'm out of breath, I'm in pain, I feel sick, I am tired, or I'm afraid. In the other group there are requests and questions. I need help. Call the doctor, call my family. How am I doing? Since the patient cannot use a dictionary, does not know some of the terms, we have created a grid with letters where they can write the word they want to say and also an outline of the human body, so that after highlighting the symptom or pain, they can show the part where the symptom is felt and its intensity. Considering that this epidemic is global and that these resources could help people around the world, we have translated it into different languages, such as Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, French, English, German. Everyone can access the archives of this material, print it, classify it and offer it to the health services of your cities. We are very happy to know that this resource has already arrived in many hospitals, health centers and ambulances throughout Brazil. We have received reports of how the relationship between the patient and the healthcare staff is changing and is better informed finding that this simple resource makes it possible to establish a new type of communication and provide more adequate care. And on the part of the patients, they are relieved of the anguish and tension of not being able to communicate. At the beginning of this pandemic, back in March, we received an email from our parish asking for people to stay in contact with the elderly parishioners to make sure that they would feel connected with the parish life, to whom many of them have given so much of their lives. I responded to this very happily, and every Saturday I started contacting these people that I had a list of 12 names to call regularly. I did not know any of them, and neither did I. So the first conversation was a little bit very quick, 
very short, not very much uh, in-depth conversation because they didn't feel very comfortable. As time went by, these experiences changed completely as they, they feel that we really feel so much more connected. There is a, a feeling of family amongst us and they look forward to my call every Saturday morning. And if I happen to be running light, they get a little bit concerned. I'd just like to share one particular experience with one of the, the elderly people, this lady who has, due to her deteriorating health condition, suffers from pain, acute pain, constantly. And I can feel that in the sound of the voice when I talk to her. So I make a point to make sure that before I finish the conversation with her, she feels a little bit more relaxed and a little bit more at peace. And I often tell her that God loves us so much and that we can carry on together. This gives us a sense of peace and we can carry on the conversation a lot more freely. We are looking forward to the time where we can actually meet each other face to face and really get to know each other much better. And looking forward to keep on building this family that we have already been building. Hi, I'm Nguyen from Vietnam. I am here with my family and I want to tell you about my experience. Last summer, a friend gave me some money to be used to help feed children belonging to some minority ethnic groups in the Highlands. In the past, we have done this outreach activity with my family and friends every time we go back to the town where I was born for the holidays. It makes me happy to see them happy. With my dad, we thought of doing it again this summer. As I was working out the cost of helping around 200 children, I realised that the money we had was not enough. Then I remembered I had been given some extra allowance from my parents as a reward for having very good grades at school last year. My dad had once asked me if I was happy with that reward, and I had said yes. Then he had suggested, why don't you share your happiness with other children? At first, I thought I would use the money to buy all the things I wanted. Then I felt Jesus was telling me, If you give, you will also receive more in return. So, I decided to use my personal allowance to complete the shortfall in my budget. With the help of my uncle, who is a priest, we were able to distribute really nice snacks to these children on a Sunday after Mass. It was also a chance to remind them to throw away the rubbish properly as a way of caring for the environment. They were all cooperative and very happy. I think I would like to do this more often in the future. The happiness I felt was indeed the hundredfold I received from Jesus in return for what I had given. Thank you. Come on. Have I turned a hundred? Oh yes, you have. A hundred? Can it be true? It is true. It's true, it's true. Hooray! Cheers! <laughs> Danilo Zanzuki and his wife Anna Maria were among the first couples to get to know the Focolari in the 1950s. Io ho sempre avuto fiducia di Anna Maria. I have always trusted Anna Maria and she has always trusted me, even when I was wrong. But it's true. It's true we love each other. Ci siamo voluti bene e quel messaggio che possiamo lasciare ai nostri figli. And the message that we can leave to our children, our relatives and the people who know us is this: love one another because this love remains even beyond, even in heaven. It will remain in heaven too. Anche in paradiso. Anche in paradiso. E e quando saremo là and when we are there, we will be glad that we loved each other. For his 100th birthday, many families around the world show their affection and gratitude with a celebration via live streaming. He also received birthday greetings from Pope Francis, from the President and the Co-President of the Focolari, and from the Mayor of Grotta Ferrata, who rejoiced with this citizen, who came to the Castelli Romani a few decades ago from the north of Italy, where he was born. As a young man, 
Danilo had lived through the war and was twice almost miraculously saved from death. Those experiences left him with a great love of life. It was the spring of 1950. I was a young engineer and had started work in the construction industry in Milan. I went for my meals to a canteen named after Cardinal Ferrari. There, I always saw a group of young people gathered together. One evening, one of them came over to my table. It was seven in the evening, and I wanted to go to bed early. I was very tired after work. That man was Guglielmo Boselli, and he said to me, Zanzuki, this evening a young lady from Trent is coming to share a new experience. Would you like to come? Out of politeness, I said, I'll come, and I went. That young lady was Ginetta Cagliari, and she told the story of the early days of the movement to this group of young people. What remained in my soul very strongly was that we need to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all our strength. Sometime later, he and Anna Maria were married. On deepening their knowledge of the charism of unity, they understood that God was calling them to give themselves to him as married for Clarini, a path that was very new for the church. In 1962, the church gave its approval to the Focolare movement. The Holy Office approved it after studying it for a long time. But we married Focolarini, were not included. Then Chiara commissioned Igino Giordani, Spartaco Lucarini and I to go and plead our case before those who represented the church for us. The Capuchin father listened to us very kindly, but basically he told us, I understand your aspirations, but this inclusion of married couples in a religious community, as the Focolare proposed at the time, is not possible. I can't help you. We went back to Chiara like beaten dogs with our tails between our legs. Chiara saw us. She smiled and said, Your vocation is written in heaven. It is not written in the codes of canon law. And after two years, the code of canon law was changed and we entered the Focolare with all rights. <laughs> Danilio continued his career. He was a highly esteemed engineer, a local councillor, and very much engaged in the local church. But when Chiara Lupic asked him to move to the Castelli Romani to be able to work on the building of the new Focolare Center, he and Anna Maria accepted this invitation without hesitation. He also worked at Città Nuova as a layout engineer. After working for Città Nuova for 10 years, Chiara asked us to work for the families more directly. And this too was a formidable experience because it meant traveling around the world to meet families from all continents and contexts. But the impression we have every time we travel is that we are at home everywhere in the world because the family that Chiara has built is a universal family. Among Danilo's great passions is that of drawing and painting. It's something I inherited from my mother. Then Chiara saw this artistic trait in me and entrusted me, for example, with our contacts with people in the world of art. So, this is an opportunity to send a greeting, a message to everyone who has been part of our adventure. Courage, always courage, always, always, always courage. Because when we come to the end of life, we will be asked, did you have courage? If we have answered yes, we will be happy. Thank you, Danilo. Thanks, Anna Maria. Thank you for your courage, which helps us to keep going. And thanks also to Rita Besch from Brazil, 
Vince Fazio in Australia, the Nguyen family from Ho Chi Minh City for telling us their stories. Perhaps many of you already know that for some months now, a film for Italian television inspired by the life of Chiara Lubic has been in the making. No doubt many of us, and I for sure, have been wondering about who is making this film and if it covers Chiara's whole life or just a few years. And we'd like to know whether it's a documentary or not. To answer many of these questions, we went to see Saverio D'Ercole, the creative producer at Casanova Multimedia, who, with Rai Fiction, have produced this TV movie about Chiara. Casanova Multimedia is the production company collaborating with National Italian Television to produce a TV movie on Chiara Lubic, founder of the Focolare movement. They've just finished filming on location around Trent and Rome, and we're now eagerly awaiting the announcement of when the film will be broadcast on Rai Uno, Italy's major national network. Saverio D'Ercole is creative producer at Casanova Multimedia. His job is overseeing the artistic perspective of the whole film, from conception to transmission, keeping a particular eye on the construction of the storyline. Saverio, you've been working in this field for 24 years now. You've worked on around 40 film and television projects, including some high-profile productions like Coco Chanel, War and Peace, and a program on John Paul II. I imagine this film on Chiara Lubic must be very special for you. I got to know Chiara's ideal when I was 11 years old, so that's practically my whole life. From the first time I heard Chiara tell us about how everything collapsed, that she told often, I could see it in my imagination. So I've always hoped to be able to see this happen. It was an absolute dream for me to be part of the team generating a film like this. A few years ago, the former director of Rai Fiction, Tini Andreatta, said she wanted to tell the stories of great Italian women, both past and present. That was when a group of us began to think it was the right time to propose the figure of Chiara. I must also thank two of Rai's manager, Nicola Claudio and Fabrizio Zappi, because they immediately welcomed and encouraged this project. We've worked on it together for three years. Special thanks are due to our producer Luca Barbareschi of Casanova, Eliseo Fiction, because despite the great economic challenges of this film, he was determined to bring it ahead, stating clearly it was because of the content the film conveys. To condense the life of a complex figure like Chiara Lubic into a film of an hour and a half can't have been easy. I imagine you had to make difficult choices. What guided your choices of what to include about Chiara Lubic? Selecting material to fit in 90 or 100 minutes of film was extremely difficult. Of course, the writers played a key role, Giacomo Campiotti, who is also an extraordinary director, with Luisa Cotta Ramosino and Leo Tafuri, who were later joined by Francesco Arlange. We really struggled to put the story together. There was a real risk it would be a long list of events without actually becoming a story. As we gradually narrowed things down, we understood that probably the heart of the story was in the 1940s. So with great sadness in some respects, we decided to concentrate on those years with a narrative framework in the 1950s, the year Chiara was under study by the Holy Office. 
but the heart of the story, 80%, takes place in Trent between 1943 and 1946. We're dealing with fiction here, not a documentary. I want to make this very clear because people may come to it with the wrong expectations. It's fiction. So this involves a certain amount of inventiveness to be able to create an attractive story. But we've worked to respect the true story, focusing on the pillars which are the main events of Chiara's story. Chiara is played by a well-known Italian actress, Christiana Capotondi, who has immersed herself in Chiara's life, which, as we said, is both long and complex, which Chiara emerges in this film. Let me clear this up from the start. I think I can say that it's the Chiara of Giacomo Campiotti, the writer, co-writer and director, and of Christiana Capotondi. This is very important because neither of them knew the movement before or they may have heard of it, but only in a general, superficial way. So it was from their perspective from outside, and this is really important, that we approached Chiara. Each of them did this with their own professionalism and their own talent. And I think it's the combination of Giacomo's artistic dimension as co-writer and as director with Cristiana's interpretation of the role that I believe has given life to a quite extraordinary Chiara. So I think the right thing for each of us to do is to set aside our own image of Chiara, even people like me who knew her personally, in order to project ourselves into this artistic encounter made with great honesty, sincerity and depth by Giacomo and Cristiana. One last question for you, Saverio, the one that everyone is asking. When is the film going to be shown and will it be broadcast only in Italy or also abroad? I think the film will be ready for transmission early next year, 2021. As regards worldwide distribution, naturally we'd be delighted for this to happen. However, that depends on distribution rights being taken up by broadcast platforms around the world. Thanks, Severio. Good luck for the final stages. Thank you very much, and let's keep in touch. Yes, absolutely. Chiara's story began many years ago under the bombs of the Second World War. Unfortunately, still today, there are places in the world where the ideal of fraternity is being lived out among the rubble of destroyed cities. From Beirut in Lebanon, people from the Focolare community tell us how they are experiencing this particularly tough moment in their history after the explosion that destroyed the port and damaged various districts in the city on the 4th of August. On the day of the explosion, I was at my friend's house, less than a kilometer from the port. Everything happened in perfect timing, where one second more or less would have been fatal. We found ourselves in the dark, covered in dust and surrounded by smoke. A woman approached us in tears, asking for help with her injured foot. We helped her find her way out of the city, using shortcuts that we knew, as the main roads were completely blocked. The day of the explosion started out like any other day. I was at work in downtown in front of the port. About 6.05 p.m. the explosion happened. I remember we were all sitting in our offices and afterwards we looked at each other without understanding what happened. After the second explosion, I saw that the glass in the window next to me was broken. If I had still been sitting there, I would have been hurt. To this day, I can still hear the sirens sounding in my ears. The 
this tragedy has happened at one of the most difficult times in our history. For over a year now, we've been experiencing an economic and political crisis like never before. Moreover, the Lebanese currency has suffered a terrible collapse, losing more than 80% of its value. Without forgetting the difficult situation caused by the coronavirus pandemic. For me, it was a very big shock, and I felt as if something broke inside me. I lost hope in the future. How can we still believe in a future when every time we build something, everything collapses? When the explosion happened, I faced death. I had a strange feeling that my life on Earth was over. For several seconds, I was afraid. But at that very moment, I heard this voice inside telling me that my life here was not over. God is with us and he loves us. He never abandons anyone. That's when I really understood what it means to entrust your life to God. The one thing that really gave me hope was Pope Francis's words addressed to the Lebanese people and the whole world that gave us a glimpse of being able to see beyond what we are living in the present moment. The next day, as soon as I woke up, I immediately talked about it with the young people, all the ones I knew, because I felt we had to do something concrete to help the people of Gemaize, Quarantina, Beirut, the areas most affected. I sent my employer a message that I would not be going to work and that I wasn't sure how best to do it, perhaps taking a day off because I wanted to go and help. We didn't know what we were going to do. We just wanted to help whoever was there. At the end of the day, my boss called me and thanked me for my decision. He added that he wouldn't count that as a day off because he understood how serious the situation was and how much help was needed. After a few days, even though we were actually helping, I felt frustrated we'd done so little. I said, maybe these people need something more, more dedication, support. I can give so little in my own way through small things like fixing the curtains, sweeping or sitting and listening to people and building a relationship with them. I realized this is what they really did need and that they felt love and found dignity after having really lost everything. Here in Lebanon, there are also sponsorship initiatives that support more than 100 families in these times of crisis. Hot food and other basic necessities are still being distributed to families in need. Of course, perhaps there is no hope. But we continue to look for it together, and we continue to believe that despite all the destruction and death, despite the pain, there is love, there is unity, and there is a beautiful future that we can all discover together. We thank Noor, Georgette, Salim, and Marie-Claire, and also Geraldo and Rita, who made this report in Beirut in conditions that are certainly not easy. Thanks very much to you all. We are really with you all. 
and many people have shown this already by making donations through the emergency coordination of the Focolari movement, which immediately activated the first aid that was sent and now through Action for United World and the New Families Association is starting rebuilding work in the apartments and shops and helps children who have to follow school at a distance. Fundraising is still active and anyone wanting to contribute can go to the uh, Support Us section of the Association for United World website or to the Donate Now page of the New Families Association charity website. Thanks for your generosity. Here with us, there's a mouse. Thank you for being with us now. I was very struck by the last words that Marie Claire said in Lebanon. Maybe there is no hope, but we keep looking for it together. Where can we go and find this hope? I would say that we need to remember Chiara's first message. We can find it in love, the love that Chiara spoke to us right from the very beginning of the movement when it began, the love that puts its roots, that has its roots in God. Many of us were there when Chiara spoke about the little flame that God kindles in the heart, our hearts. It's God's love that God puts into the hearts of people and it has characteristics of God's love. So it must be the love that Chiara herself spoke about in the message that we heard at the beginning of the link up. It must be a disinterested love, a universal love, one that's able to welcome others, to forgive people, to be merciful not to expect anything from others. This love is the little flame that's a tiny seed of God's love that God himself has put into the heart of every single person because all people are children of God and they all have this little flame and we can't turn it off or out or blow it out. But if we don't, or we can blow it out, but if we don't, it can grow it can become a seed, and that seed is generative, it's fruitful, it generates something, it generates other lives, other opportunities, and it makes something grow. So it's in love that we can root our hope. And our uh, poet, Italian poet Dante Alighieri, he said, a tiny spark creates a great flame, a tiny spark creates a great flame if it's of love, if this spark is of love in the person's heart, it can transform us and transform the people around us. So let's look for our hope there. Thank you. Amos, the Pope has been in Assisi today, signing his new encyclical on all brothers. And he said, the effort to build a more just society implies a capacity for fraternity and a spirit of human sharing and fellowship. And does, it, does it surprise you, this title? Not at all. This is the greatest need of humanity today. The Pope knows how to be an echo of this need. And in this encyclical, he wanted to put, bring us all together to seek answers, to find the answers to these needs of humanity, this need of humanities. He is the mouthpiece, as it were, of this disoriented world. He has grasped this pain of humanity and is presenting it to everyone. And in front of this, we must ask ourselves, what can we do? What can we do? If you allow me, I would like to speak to all of you, all of those who feel called by God to do something, to respond, and to do it by giving ourselves completely, the whole of ourselves, without measure, without mm, holding back, without interruption, to give ourselves completely. All those people who feel called by God and who have found in the charism of unity, in Chiara's charism, a help, which has helped them see that it's 
possible. We've had the experience, concrete, true and deep experience of unity. And so they feel they've had a calling and it's a grace. And they want to make this grace available to everybody. I, I like all these people to be in front of me to say to them all, oh, let's do this together, let's do this together. We've had a calling. We've received a gift, a gift which has allowed us to have this experience, but this calling to fraternity, which for us is the calling to may they all be one, the call to unity, this calling that we feel so strongly within us and that calls on us, invites us to look up high, to look far ahead. This unity we would like to be reflected in the unity that is lived in heaven. We would like on earth to live the life of heaven, the life that is in the Trinity, where there is unity and distinction that they co that coexist together, that each person respects the other, each person makes room for the other, each person seeks to make the other come to the fore, each person tries to lose themselves in depth so that the other person can express themselves fully. And, and in this nothingness, there truest identity comes to the fore, a unity that is so great that is lived in heaven and we would like to see lived on earth has only one example. Only one can give us the example. It's the example of Jesus. Jesus who is God, who was able, who knew how to set aside to lose his being God, to come down on earth, to become man and to share on the cross in the moment of his forsakenness, all the forsakenness, all the pain, all the anguish, all the sufferings, all the extremisms, all the victimization, all the woundedness, the forsakenness that all people of all time and every place have experienced. And by taking them on himself, by taking them on himself with such great love, he managed to rebuild, to remake the unity that had been broken between God and humankind, between all people and with the whole of creation. So this is the example we have before us. If we can have such a great love as this, we can bear witness to the world that this unity exists, this unity is possible, that this unity has already begun. I would like all those people who, who feel that they want to do it, who are listening to me now, who feel that they can take on such a, a deep commitment that all together we could be for the Pope, a first answer, a first response that's already happening, that's a consolation for him, that gives him hope because there's already something happening. And we would like all of us together, all of those who want to, all who want to work with this great aim, all of us, we'd like to be all over the world. We, a small little group that is inspired by the charism uh, given to us by Chiara Lubick and aspires to be this family throughout the world, we'd like us to be a little beginning, a little part, a little spark, but an effective one of that leaven that can enter into humanity and that can transform it and truly become the start of a united world, a new world. I'd like to take this commitment together with you. I commit myself. I want to put the whole of myself into this and I invite all of you, all those who want to, thank you, we want to be with you, this leaven that ferments and transforms and makes the whole of humanity a united world. Thank you, thank you. Grazie. So, Alessandra, tell me. We've almost come to the end. Yes, but there are still some important events to tell you about. Okay, all right, all right. So, I'll start. So, the first concerns a Jen girl who was able to reach the hearts of many people in the world. You all know Chiara Luce Badano on September the 25th, 2010, 10 years ago, she was beatified. And on October the 7th, it will be the 30th anniversary of her death. 
This is why the Chiara Badano Foundation has organized some events that can be followed via streaming, including many testimonies from people who knew Chiara Luce personally. For times and other information, go to the Chiara Luce website, chiarabadano.org. Then on the 15th of October, there'll be the international event, Global Compact on Education, which will be 100% online. If you want to know more about this event, to generate a change of mentality in the field of education, you can go to the website, educationglobalcompact.org. Then, from the 23rd to the 25th of October, there'll be an international event, New Ways Towards Integral Ecology, five years after Laudato Si, organized by ECHO One, the ecological network of the Focolari movement with expert speakers from around the world. For further information, go to echoone.org. And finally, the Economy of Francesco, which will take place online from the 19th to the 21st of November. The Pope will also participate on the last day. For all the information you need, go to the site francescoeconomy.org. That's it. We finished all our information. No, no. When will the next link-up be? I was just about to say that, really. The next link-up will be on the 5th of December at 12 noon, Italian time. Okay, that's great. So we'll all be together again on the 5th of December. But before saying goodbye, thank you, Michele. Thanks to everyone who's made this link up really amazing. Truly, thanks to you, Alan, to all of you, and to all of you who've been with us this evening. A huge embrace from all of us. Bye. See you soon.